All right, let's turn in our Bibles to Exodus chapter 12. We're going to be looking at verses 21 through 28 this morning. As you're turning there, uh, please remember that God's promise that his word will not return unto him empty, but it will prosper, it will succeed uh, for the purposes that which he sent it. Uh, title to our message this morning is uh, Passover part five, Catechize Your Children. Exodus chapter 12, starting in verse 21. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. You shall observe this ride as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this service. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and worshiped. Then the people of Israel went and did so as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron so they did. That sends the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Father, we confess this morning, it's not by might, it's not by power, it's by your spirit. We pray that your spirit now would illuminate us, um, give us a, a spirit of wisdom and knowledge and the revelation of your son, enlighten the eyes of our hearts that we may know the hope to which we've been called. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you may be seated. So if you're, just, if you're just joining us, so far nine plagues have been unleashed on Egypt, decimating them because they refused to let Israel go. And the 10th plague is yet to come, and, and by far it is the most significant plague because... This plague tells the story of the gospel. All Egypt and all of Israel have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All are under the threat of the last plague because all have sinned. But God. And we don't see those words in our text, but that's the grammar of grace. But God provided a way of escape, provided a way of redemption for his people. Go get a lamb without blemish, slaughter it for each home, and the Lord would see the blood of the lamb on each doorpost, and he would pass over that house. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. So the Passover wasn't about the blood of an animal. It was about the blood of Christ, God's only son, the, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So the Passover is the gospel of the Old Testament. Now, last week, we saw that in response to Passover, the Hebrews were to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They were not to eat leaven or have leaven in their house for seven days. Uh, leaven, in this particular instance, uh, represented the wicked deeds of their former lives. So they were to leave the leaven of Egypt behind them. And this is a picture of the entire Christian life. After the cross, after Jesus freed us from the penalty of sin through his death and resurrection, we are not to be slaves to that sin any longer. We're to mortify our sin. We're to put off the old man and put on the new man. Now, this morning, what we just read were the instructions that Moses now gives to the elders in Israel. The previous dialogue in verses 1 through 20 
uh, was God instructing Moses, and now Moses turns to the elders and instructs the people. And new information is given here. In particular, we see that Israel was to catechize their children. Now, this word catechism is not in our passage, uh, but it's the birthplace of it. Uh, catechism comes from a New Testament word, kataheo, and it's used in several places. It just means instruction, teaching, or doctrine. So all doctrinal teaching is catechesis. But there's a specific species of it that takes the shape of question and answer, and we call that catechism. Catechism was born here at Passover. Uh, Moses says in verses 26 and 27, when your children ask, what does this mean? You shall answer such and such. See, Passover was never meant to be a wordless event. It was to be accompanied with proclamation. That proclamation, that catechism was the life of Passover, Catechism is what planted the truths of the gospel down in the hearts of their little ones who were the seedlings of the future church. And catechism is how God would have us pass down the gospel to the next generation. John Calvin put it in most uh, stark terms. He said in a letter to the Lord Protector of England in 1548, believe me, the church of God will never be preserved without catechesis. I mean, we can see this in the Old Testament. Whenever catechism, uh, whenever Israel fell away from catechism, so fell Israel. And whenever catechism was revived, so Israel was revived. And so it is in our day. If the church loses doctrinal instruction, it loses all of its strength and all of its vigor. But if we recover catechism, if we're reformed after the word of God, if we can expect more and more of God's kingdom to grow, missionaries to be sent, the lost to be converted, and revivals to ensue. So here is our outline as we move forward this morning. First, we're going to see that catechism is a duty to God. Secondly, Catechism is an inescapable concept. And then thirdly, catechism is a generational feast. So let's see, first of all, how this is a duty to God. This kind of doctrinal instruction that is aimed at our children isn't mainly, isn't mainly a duty that we owe them. It is a duty that we owe them. If we love our covenant children, we're going to train them up. We're going to catechize them in the way that they should go, Proverbs 22, 6. But catechism is only secondarily about our children. It's, it's primarily about God. Uh, he commands this to take place. Look with me in verses 25 through 27. After Moses recounts some of the, the requirements of Passover, he gives multiple imperatives. Notice three you shalls here. Verse 24, you shall observe this rite as a statute for you and your sons forever. Verse 25, when you come to the land that the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep this service. Verses 26 and 27, and when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. So God commands not only that Passover would be observed uh, through the food that they were to prepare, but he commands them to teach their children what these things mean. Look again at verse 26. When your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? When your children say to you, uh, M Moses was, was not saying here that, hey, have a silent Passover until curiosity finally drives your children uh, to speak up. 
No, the, the doctrinal instruction doesn't depend upon the children asking the question. The point here is that when their children were old enough, when they were capable enough to be taught these things, to ask these questions, then instruction was to be directed to them in particular. Uh, no parent was relieved from catechizing little Johnny because little Johnny didn't ask the right questions. That's, that's not the point here. Um, in fact, in traditional Cedar and Passover celebrations, uh, it was the youngest son or the youngest child who was responsible uh, to ask what made this night different. So as one author notes, quote, the youngest son uh, normally asked the question about the meaning of the service. And the purpose of the father's words was to make the meaning of the Passover known to him. The youngest present asks four questions, which inquired the meaning of the night's ritual. The story of the deliverance from Egypt and its meaning is then declared by the head of the household and other participants. So this was a whole family affair in which there was dialogue going on between father and children and other family members. They were all retelling the story together. That, and that, that's the soul of Passover night. Not the particular food that they ate, not the particular rituals they performed, but what those things meant. God commanded that his story be told over and over again, year after year, forever. That brings us then to our, our first principle. Loved ones, catechism is a duty that we owe God. Um. It's a duty that we owe God. It's not just, well, that's not what my family does. Well, God says to do this. Um, and consider just two other places in Scripture where God requires this of parents as part of the worship that we give them. Apart from any New Testament passages, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 20 through 21. Same type of uh, formula here. Deuteronomy 6. 20 through 21, when your son asks you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and the statutes and the rules that the Lord our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. Turn to one more place, Joshua chapter 4, verse 21. This was after children of Israel already entered into the promised land. God parted the Jordan River uh, for them to enter. And then he had Israel set up 12 memorial stones and place it on the other side of the river in commemoration of this event. Joshua chapter 4, verse 21. And Joshua said to the people of Israel, when your children... Ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Then you shall let your children know. Israel passed over this Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea. This is a, the, the, the smallest example, but the point here is that in all of God's works of redemption, God has commanded that a doctrinal dialogue, a catechism take place between parents and their children. Why? Well, the answer is right here in Joshua 4. So track with me. Verse 21, when your children ask. Verse 22, then you shall let your children know. Verse 24, why? So that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. So right there is, is the, the whole point of catechism. Catechism is for the global glorification of the Lord Most High. That's how the gospel is spread all over the world. And dear congregation, this is why catechisms have been made in every single age of the church. We just read one after the baptism this morning. The Apostles' Creed was a form of catechetical instruction. 
John Calvin wrote uh, the Catechism of the Church of Geneva. Martin Luther wrote a, a catechism called the Small Catechism. The Westminster Assembly wrote the Larger and Shorter. Uh, Zacharias Ursinus wrote the Heidelberg Catechism. The Puritans, John Owen, John Cotton, Richard Baxter wrote catechisms. Charles Spurgeon, Jonathan Edwards, they all wrote catechisms. Why was the church, why has the church been so heavily focused on this task? What were these men aiming at? They're aiming at the glory of God. They wanted the knowledge of the glory of God to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. That's what catechism is aimed at. So, so this type of doctrinal instruction that, that includes God and Christ and, and salvation and the word is how we help our covenant children taste and see that the Lord is good all to the glory of God. If we're relying on one hour a week of instruction for our children, it will not suffice against the hours and hours of cultural catechism that they get in the world. Someone might say here, well, I don't have any children, so how is this relevant for me? Don't you think that that objection would have, could have been raised back in Exodus 12? When God commanded this in Exodus 12, not everyone there had children either. See, this is a duty for all of the covenant people of God, not just parents, so, so for, for some of you, all, you, your children are all grown up. So then, then apply this to your grandchildren. Teach them, feed them, catechize them. Do you realize that Timothy in the New Testament, uh, he was saved largely because of the catechism of his grandmother. First Timothy, or Second Timothy 1.5, Paul says, I'm reminded, Timothy, of your sincere faith, a faith that dwelt first in your grandmother, Lois. He had a Greek father. He wasn't getting catechized in the Christian faith at all, but it was his grandmother and his mother that catechized him. A small number of you perhaps don't have children at all, and maybe you never will. Well, how do you apply this? Well, don't you realize that you are a Christian right now at least instrumentally, because others were catechized before you, and then they brought you that pure spiritual milk to drink. Hebrews 13, 7 says, Remember those leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. There are younger Men and younger women, if not in age, then in the faith, that God would have you to disciple and train and catechize. God just deposited that instruction in you so that you could then take it to them. Perhaps some of you feel completely ill-equipped to even begin this work. Well, then I would encourage you, ask an older Christian to disciple you, to catechize you, to train you. So that's our first point, that catechism is a duty that we owe to God, first and foremost. Psalm 78.4, the psalmist says, we will not hide them from our children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. Those are our options, hiding it or declaring it. So let's look secondly then and how catechism is an inescapable concept. Let's turn back to Exodus chapter 12. Look again with me at verse 26. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? Notice it, it doesn't say, now if your children say to you, no, it says, and when your children say to you. When those Hebrew children uh, became capable um, of understanding what was going on, they saw the lamb being slaughtered, they saw the blood being smeared on the, the door, uh, the bitter herbs were being tasted. They knew that this night was like no other night, and, and they would have inescapably asked the question, why are we doing this? 
What does this mean? Don't our own children ask these type of questions about baptism and the Lord's Supper? Uh, one of our children tugging on our, our shirts, oh, hey, when can I take Lord's Supper? Why, what's going on there? When can I be baptized? See, God designed the sacraments, the very uniqueness of them, to provoke our children to ask those questions. They're inescapable questions. So, so really, the, the only issue is, is who will be answering these questions and, and which answers will be given? That brings us then to our second principle this morning, that, that catechism is an inescapable concept. It's not whether our children will be catechized, but which catechism will our children be taught? Catechism is an inescapable concept. It's not whether our children will be catechized, but which catechism will our children be taught? We've already seen this in the proof um, when we are looking at the, the eighth plague. Turn with me a couple pages back to Exodus chapter 10, verse 10. Look at what Pharaoh tells Moses. After the plague... He says, fine, you can go, but who are you going to take with you? Moses says, everybody's going, the young and the old. And then Pharaoh tells him this in chapter 10, verse 10. The Lord be with you if ever I let you and your little ones go. If you remember the point from that message, the dragon wanted to make those little Hebrew boys and girls Egyptians. This is what the dragon is always up to. He's always up to catechizing our children. Um, this was King Ben-Hadad's goal in 1 Kings 20, verse 3, when he required Israel's children as a term of surrender. He said, your silver and your gold are mine. Your best wives and your children also are mine. His aim was to re-catechize Israel's children with a pagan faith, a pagan religion, and a pagan morality. This was Nebuchadnezzar's goal. When, when he took Judah into Babylonian captivity, he took their Beth's youths, didn't he? What did he do? He catechized them with Babylonian literature, language, and philosophy, Daniel 4, he, with a Babylonian diet contrary to God's commands, Daniel 1, 5, and with new Babylonian names in order to erase their Jewish identity, Daniel 1, 7. All of that is catechesis. And this is the same goal that we see with the dragon today. Um, you don't even have to look. There was a, a drag show recently in New York City. And their church, this cult, was streaming down the, the street and the gay choir was singing these words. We're here, we're queer, we're coming for your children. We're coming for your children. They're, they're telling us what they're doing. The dragon has the same play in every generation to indoctrinate, to catechize, to steal the hearts of our children. So it's not whether our children are catechized, but which catechism will our children be taught? What we must understand is that the dying culture always has a catechism that is anti-Christ. Always. Um, what effective Christian catechism does is it deconstructs anti-Christian ideologies. So let me say that one more time. What effective Christian catechism does is it deconstructs anti-Christian ideologies. J Jesus was the master um, catechesis teacher. What did he do on the Sermon on the Mount? He always said this. You have heard it said... But I say to you, he's not, saying, he's not saying you've heard it said in the Old Testament. He's saying you have heard it said, meaning this is what the culture tells you is true. But I say to you, this is what God's truth is. You have to get this point. The work of catechism is largely polemical. It's combative. Um, when Moses brought the words of Yahweh to Pharaoh, it contradicted and it warred against everything Pharaoh and, Moses and, and Egypt believed. Um, 
And, and this is how all good catechisms work. I mean, if you've looked at the catechisms during the Reformation time, do you know what they're extremely heavy with? They're extremely heavy with the doctrine of justification and the doctrine of the sacraments. Hardly anything is um, spoken about about the Trinity. Why is that? Because the Trinity War was fought a thousand years earlier. Rome, in particular, uh, was drowning in a heretical view of salvation, and that's what their catechisms were aimed at. So, so what are the catechisms that our culture is confronting with us today? It's not hard, right? Just a little bit of imagination. There's a gender uh, catechism, right? You can identify uh, as whatever gender you want, and people must support that. But what does Jesus say? Matthew 19, 4, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? God determines our sex, not man. There's a marriage catechism. You can marry whoever and however many people you want to marry. But what does Jesus say? Matthew 19, 5, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. God says that marriage is between one man and one woman. There's a political catechism today. The civil sphere is neutral territory. Keep your God out of it. But what does Jesus say? Matthew 20, 18, all authority in heaven and earth have been given to me. Jesus says, that both the church and the state must bow to him. All are under his authority. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that we focus only on these. God forbid. Certainly, we must give our children the whole counsel of God, creation, fall, redemption, glory. But if we don't confront the culture in catechesis, then we're being naive and careless because our culture is coming against our children with these very things. And the scripture gives us a fearful warning for failing to catechize our children. Let's turn to Judges chapter 2. Now, if you know the, the flow of the Bible, after the first five books, then the book of Joshua takes place where Joshua leads the people of Israel into the promised land, and Judges picks up right after that. So look with me at Judges chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 6. When Joshua dismissed the people, the people of Israel went each to his inheritance to take possession of the land. And the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great work that the Lord had done for Israel. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110 years, and they buried him within the boundaries of his inheritance in timnath Hariz, in the hill country of Ephraim, north of the mountain of Gash. And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, or the work that he had done for Israel. Uh, for the longest time, I've missed this last phrase. How could they not know the work that the Lord did for Israel? Passover was specifically designed for parents to teach their children the great work that God had done year after year. It was built in. Well, apparently the previous generation didn't teach them the great works of God. They didn't catechize their children. Now, hear this carefully. No parent can catechize their children into the kingdom. This isn't like a magic formula. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But it's also true that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Catechism exposes children to the truths of God's word. And the previous generation failed to do that. And look what happened as a result. Look with me at verse 11. 
And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals. And they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who had brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them, and they bowed down to them. See, they were being doctrinally instructed by these pagan gods. And they provoked the Lord to anger. Verse 15, where whenever they marched out, the hand of the Lord was against them for harm as the Lord had warned and as the Lord had sworn to them, and they were in terrible distress. Do you see here that a failure to instruct the next generation leads to slavery, it leads to distress, and it leads to judgment? Hosea 4, 6, God says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. So dear congregation, let us not be those who, who fail to catechize our children. Let us not be failed to pass on the great works that God has done. So that's our second point, that, that catechism is inescapable. It's not whether our children are catechized, but which catechism will our children be taught? So let's look at how catechism is a general is a generational feast. In preparing for this message this week, I felt um, guilt and shame over the ways in which I have um, failed uh, at, at times with my own children here. Um, no, no parent can say that they have pulled this off perfectly. No father can. And there's no doubt that this task ultimately falls to fathers. Verse 21 in our passage, we read that Moses called the elders of Israel. He was directly instructing them. The, the elders of Israel would have been the, uh, the men, the heads of each clan or tribe. These were the patriarchs. And this task was to fall on the shoulders of fathers. It's not that mothers can't or shouldn't catechize. They, they can and they should. But but fathers especially are the ones uh, that are responsible to make sure that it happens in their homes for their children. Puritan William Perkins says here that the father is the principal agent, director, and furtherer of the worship of God within his own family. Remember, it was Joshua, um, the father of his home, who stood up uh, at the end of the book, and he said, uh, choose this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So fathers, perhaps you haven't led your family in this. Perhaps for some of you, the desires of the world has choked out the word. What should you do? Well, brothers, there's only one thing that you can do. And it's good news. It's repent and ask the Lord for forgiveness and then change course. Go to, your, go to your wife, go to your children and ask for their forgiveness and then begin the task of catechizing your family. And this is what you'll find. You'll find the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Passover lamb. This will actually strengthen your heart because in the heart of catechism, you'll find the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. This isn't about checkmarking boxes for what, you, what you, you need to do, what your duty is. God is inviting you to a feast. This is for your, you and for your sons forever. Consider once again the origin of this plague. The death of the firstborn was coming against all. Egyptians and Hebrews, they were all under the same death, death sentence. They were guilty of the same sins, the same idolatry. In other words, Israel was confronted with the fact that they deserved the same dreadful judgment as Egypt. Death was coming unless a substitute could be found. Don't you see that this Passover rite was a proclamation that God has done something about their sin? And that's what catechism is. You get to rehearse with your children that God has done something about our sin. That's not just a feast for them. 
It's a feast for you. Children, look what God has done with our sin. He's placed it on the Lamb of God, the Lamb without spot, the Lamb without blemish, and he burned him in the fire. He he suffered under the wrath of his Father for us. That's a feast. That's our third principle, that catechism is a feast that nourishes our own souls, our children, and, and the generations to come with the gospel. So consider this feast, loved ones. Find mercy for you and your children in catechism. Consider three catechism questions as we conclude our time together. First, first question, why will I be spared from the wrath to come? Why will I be spared from the judgment to come? Answer, because Jesus Christ, the Passover lamb, took my place. Verse 21, Moses commanded them to kill the Passover lamb. The lamb was to become a substitute in their place. The lamb's death meant that God's wrath was propitiated. It was satisfied. Don't you see that this lamb of God deals with the greatest fear that you and your children have, the fear of death and judgment. And that's what you get to rehearse to your children, that Jesus Christ was sacrificed in our place. No other sacrifice could atone, only the God-man. Being man, Jesus obeyed the law so that when he looks at you, he sees you have fulfilled all of the obedience that God has required. And being God, he suffered the infinite Wrath of God, so that his death was sufficient. So fathers, catechize your home with that Christ, with that Lamb of God who takes away all sin. Second question. How can I be cleansed from all my sin? Answer. By receiving Christ through faith alone. This lamb had to die, but the blood had to be applied. Look at verse 22. They're instructed, take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the lintel with the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. Hyssop was used in the law for ceremonial cleansing. Remember when David cried out after his great sin with Bathsheba and Uriah, he said, purge me with the hyssop and I shall be clean. The Hebrews applied the blood to the doors with with hyssop, and this signified two things. First, it signified faith. The smearing of the blood on the doorposts was an act of faith. And the hyssop branch covered in blood was the agent of cleansing. Dear congregation, that's how you are cleansed from your sin, by applying the blood through faith. Acts 15, 9 says that God has cleansed our hearts through faith. You're not dirty anymore. Your greatest problem of sin and infection and corruption and guilt and shame has been cleansed. Not because of your works, not because of how good you have been, but by faith alone. Scripture says, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to be called the children of God. Fathers, feed your children that word because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Third question, where is my comfort and assurance found? Where is my comfort and assurance found? Answer, in knowing that the Lord sees the blood. And knowing that the Lord sees the blood. In verse 23, we read, For the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood, the Lord will pass over. When he sees the blood. Oh, what a comfort that is. You know, when when we see the blood, when we understand the 
the atonement and we have it in our minds. Oh, it brings such great comfort. Oh, it brings such great joy. But what happens when despair sets in? What happens when we're blind to the blood? Children, boys and girls, imagine that you were a firstborn in Egypt on that night. You guys ate the lamb together. You, you ate the bitter herbs. Your, your dad smeared the blood on the door, and then it was time to go to bed. And it got dark outside. And you started hearing the shrieks of the Egyptians as people were dying. Would that scare you? My little dog was terrified at the July 4th celebration with fireworks. How much more would you be terrified to hear death shrieks? And what if you couldn't see the blood on the door? Would that mean that therefore somehow God had forgotten about you? No. The scripture says, he, when I see the blood, when I see the blood, I will pass over. God still sees the blood. Dear congregation, this is so important. Your salvation, your assurance doesn't rest on your own feelings. It doesn't rest on your own confidence. It doesn't even rest on you being in your right minds. Your salvation ultimately rests on God seeing the blood of Christ applied to your account. He sees the blood even when you forget, even when you're scared. Even when you're despondent in your sin, God sees the blood. Listen to what Spurgeon says here. It is not our sight of the sprinkled blood, which is the basis of our salvation, but God's sight of it. God's acceptance of Christ is our guarantee. In the thick darkness when you cannot see it all, the Lord God never fails to see in Jesus that which, with which he is well pleased. So fathers, teach your children that God always sees the blood, that their salvation doesn't depend upon them holding themselves up, but it depends upon God's faithfulness. It depends on the God who never fails. It depends on the promise of God that he will never leave us nor forsake us. So catechize your children for that Christ in the catechism is for you and for your sons forever. Let's pray. Let's pray. Father, if, if any of us fathers have failed in catechism, and we know that if you were to look at our record, there's been many failures. Help us to run to you. Help us to see that, that in this Passover celebration that, that foretold the gospel is all of the forgiveness that we need. Help us to remember, Lord, that the essence of parenting is discipleship. And when your son commissioned us to go and make disciples, including our children, he gave us that promise. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Help us to remember, Lord, that your Son is with us in our homes, ready to assist us, ready to aid us in this great task of catechism. And so, Lord, may we pursue this all for your great glory. For Jesus' sake we pray. Amen. Amen.